next 20 minutes or so, I am going to go over what melanoma looks like and how we diagnose it and how you can diagnose it on yourself and your loved ones. So just basic um, UV radiation, sunlight, causes lots of changes in the skin. The most frequently noticed is wrinkles. Um, actinic keratosis are precancers and are markers for a patient's risk of getting squamous cell skin cancer. Basal cell and squamous cell skin cancers are much more common than melanoma. About one in every four people gets one of those. Dr. Tarhini said melanoma is about one in 55 or one in 50. So we again look at a patient's level of sun damage and decide what their true risk of getting precancers, non-melanoma skin cancers, and melanoma skin cancers. So the two main types of ultraviolet light that you hear about are UVA, which are longer penetrating rays, and UVB. UVA are the tanning rays. That's what you get in a tanning bed. What happens is that the skin darkens immediately, but there's very little protective effect. So when somebody says, I'm going to the tanning bed to protect myself from burning down in Florida on my vacation, it's not going to work. <laughs> the other thing that some of the tanning bed industry folks are promoting is the fact that the tanning beds increase your vitamin D levels. Not true either. Ultraviolet B is what increases your, your levels of vitamin D. So again, a lot of badness in the tanning beds. There's not, not, not anything positive in there other than the positive in, increase in skin cancer. Ultraviolet B are the burning rays. Um, those, interestingly, stimulate melanin synthesis. So melanin is the pigment in your skin and pigment transfer. So you do get a delayed tan from that and you do get some sun protection uh, from burning. Um, ultraviolet A light comes right through car glass. So even in the wintertime when you're driving and you feel the heat coming through the window, those ultraviolet A rays are coming right through the window. That's why in particular men and truck drivers and such get more skin cancers on the left side of their face because that year-round sun exposure through car glass is causing that. Ultraviolet B is largely filtered by car glass. So this is a little quiz. Who do you think is older? <laughs> so the man on the left is 92 years old. He's a Tibetan monk who stayed out of the sun. The lady on the right is 60. She lived in Arizona and basically harvested corn year-round, so she didn't use sunscreen. And you can see the difference in their complexions. That is a lot of sun damage. She, even with a darker complexion, is at more risk for skin cancer because of that, that marker of wrinkling. So as was mentioned, melanoma is the sixth most frequent cancer in women and all in, in all age groups and the fifth most common cancer in men in the United States. The estimated risk for developing a melanoma is anywhere from 1 in 50 to 1 in 68, depending on um, which paper you read. It's increasing faster than any other type of cancer in the United States, and it comprises about 5% of all skin cancers and 75% of all skin cancer deaths. So it's something that we want to diagnose early and treat appropriately. It's the leading cause of cancer deaths in women aged 25 to 36. So we see a lot of melanomas in young women who come in for cosmetic procedures before they're going to get married. And if I see a fair skin individual, I say, I need to do a skin check on you, even though you're here for a chemical peel. And I can't tell you how many melanomas we've found on women who've been in tanning beds in that age group. In 2018, there'll be roughly 91,000 new cases of melanoma with about 9,000 deaths. So one person dies of melanoma every hour. This is something we want to prevent. The five-year survival rates, as was mentioned, are getting better, largely due to earlier diagnosis, which is why I'm talking to you today, improved surgical treatment, which Dr. Gassman will talk about, and improved medical treatment, which will be covered by the other speakers. I want to draw your attention to the schematic here. When you hear the term melanoma in situ, what that means is the melanoma cells are just in the upper layer of the skin. So this purple layer is your epidermis. That's where the melanoma cells start. If they invade down into the second layer of the skin, the dermis or deeper, that's when the term invasive melanoma is used. So that's just some basis for some of the further discussion later. So we want to catch these very early in the in situ stage where they're 99.999% curable. Okay. As far as risk factors for melanoma, this was briefly mentioned already. About 10% of people with melanoma have a family history of melanoma. So we ask that of our patients when they come in. Have you had a family member with melanoma or a non-melanoma skin cancer? Fair complexion, that means red hair, blue eyes, freckles, um, history of severe blistering sunburns. I had those. I did use baby oil in my younger years, which was not wise. And the foil-lined album covers so that we could get some hair. Not a good idea. Excessive sun exposure, as was mentioned, um, the highest incidences in Australia and New Zealand, which are close to the equator. Tanning bed use is something we're really trying to curtail because we know that this is causing a lot of the skin cancer risk. And of course, environmental exposure to mutagens, so chemicals and such. 
individuals who've had blistering sunburns, and generally the number is five in their life, and usually in the teenagers, have double the risk of getting a melanoma. I sadly had a couple of summer, so I'm watching very carefully. The Fitzpatrick skin, scale, skin type scale is something that we categorize our patients into because it tells us what their risk of skin cancer is. So we start with one, which means those patients are frecklers, they're very pale, they can never tan, they burn all the time, even if they use sunscreen. Two is where I sit. I actually probably merge freckles to get a tan, but I can tan. Um, I'm, a, I'm a two. In this room, I was looking around when y'all were coming in. We've got pretty much all the skin types but six. Six is the darkest African-American skin. So as you would guess, the further you go up on the scale, the more protective melanin there is on your skin. So it's not that your skin cancer risk is zero, but it's much, much less than the fair-skinned folks like me. Other risk factors, if a patient has a lot of moles, a lot means over 50. Um, atypical nevi, that means that the moles, and I'll show you pictures of this, have irregularly shaped edges, uneven color. It's, it's, it's a marker for a risk of melanoma. Giant congenital nevi, these are birthmarks that, that babies are born with that, depending on their size, put that baby at risk of a melanoma later in life, and usually before puberty. A history of non-melanoma skin cancer, so basal and squamous cell cancers, is a risk factor for melanoma. Immunosuppression, that means that the patient is on medicines, for example, to maintain their heart transplant or their kidney transplant or their lung transplant. They might be on medicines like this for rheumatoid arthritis. They are medicines that suppress your immune system and increase your risk of skin cancer, both melanoma and non-melanoma. And then there's some genetic syndromes such as xeroderma pigmentosum, which is a long term to mean patients whose skin cannot repair itself in response to sun damage, and they get lots of skin cancer starting at a very young age. So melanomas can come up on normal skin, or they can arise from what's called a precursor lesion, so from something that's been there a while, which can either be a birthmark or an atypical looking mole. And this is, again, a mole that was scalloped in there for a long time and all of a sudden developed a bump in it, and that should prompt a, di prompt a biopsy. Most frequent sites of melanoma in Caucasians, in men, the back, the chest, upper extremity, head and neck. In women, the back, the lower leg, from all those golf and tennis skirts, upper extremity, as well as the head and neck. But again, when people come in for a skin exam, we are looking at every inch of their skin, including the scalp, inside their mouth, and mucosal surfaces. Most frequent sites of melanoma in darker skin patients, so type 6 and Asian patients who are in the 4 to 5 range, different. The soles, <coughs> the mucous membranes, palms, and nail beds. So kind of a different pattern. We characterize melanoma in clinical subtypes, the most common of which is called a superficial spreading melanoma. It's usually flat. It's got different colors in it, and I'll show you examples of each of those. Second in line are nodular melanomas, which are a bump. Acryl and tinginous, that means on the hands and feet. So that's why when you're coming in for a skin exam, we're looking between your toes. We're looking on your palms, your nail beds, bottoms of your feet. And then lenigo malignant melanoma is a type of melanoma more common in elderly patients, 70s and 80s. And again, those patients have a very long-standing brown spot that just slowly gets bigger, and it literally can take 20 to 50 years for that to turn into invasive melanoma. So it's a more indolent or slow-growing <coughs> Some examples, superficial spreading melanoma. This is flat. Why is this bad? Irregular border, variegated color. It's not the same brown color throughout. When we tell patients to look at their moles for color, we're saying look for brown, black, red. Red means there's inflammation telling you that the body sees something it doesn't like. White, which means your immune system is eating away the pigment because it's bad. Blue means that the brown pigment has gone down into the second layer of the skin, and when brown is deep in the skin, it reflects back a blue color. So those are things we warn patients to look for. The nodular melanoma I already showed you a picture of. It's a bump. Lenigo maligna. So this woman had this over 50 years. It was brown. It just kind of slowly changed colors and expanded across her forehead. And again, that lenigo melina is just in the upper layer of the skin, so it's a very curable type of melanoma. Mucosal melanoma, again, we, that's why we look in the mouth. That's why when you go to the dentist, they're looking all over your mouth to make sure that you don't have anything like this. Something that can mimic a melanoma in the mouth, if you have a filling in your metal filling in your mouth, it can actually stain the mucosa and look like a melanoma. It's called an amalgam tattoo, so that's just something that we – excuse me, coach patients about as well. Acryl and chigenous melanoma, acryl means hands and feet. This is the bottom of a foot. Who looks at the bottom of their feet? Not many people. So again, when we counsel patients on skin exams, we want you to be looking at your entire body surface. Atypical nevi I talked about earlier are funny shaped. They're generally... Um,
Thank you. A hundred or more moles, and at least one or more of them is eight millimeters or bigger, and at least one is clinically atypical. So they may have a bunch of normal looking moles, but it's just the number that tells us it's a marker for melanoma. These patients are particularly at risk for melanoma if they don't have a personal or family history of melanoma. They have a two to 28 time risk for getting one. If they only have a family history, they have 148 percent, 140 time risk. Personal and family history, up to a 500 time risk. So it needs to say these are patients that we're going to follow very closely. If these patients have two family members with melanoma, 100 percent lifetime risk. So again, we identify these families and get their kids in starting at age 10 for skin exams. 20% of melanomas are detected by individuals other than the patient, so your spouse, your friends, your healthcare practitioners. I will tell a story. I was in church one day down in Brecksville, and there was an elderly man in front of me, and he had a melanoma on the back of his ear, and I know he couldn't see it, so I was watching the whole time. I was very distracted. I was like, sorry, God, I'm really distracted, but I have to catch this man before he leaves church today. And I thought, if he leaves after communion, I'm going to be running in the parking lot to tackle him. So I got him at the end of the mass, and I said, sir, you've got a concerning brown spot on your ear. It's, it's, it's potentially a skin cancer, and I gave him a name of somebody locally in Brexville to see. So I purposely went to the same mass the following week, and I found him. He had a Band-Aid on his ear, which either meant he got the biopsy or he was hiding it from me so I wouldn't stop him anymore. <laughs> So what are we looking for? We're looking for A, B, C, D, E. Asymmetry, if you draw a line through the mole, is it the same on both sides? Um, borders that are irregular. A good mole has a nice even edge. A bad mole potentially has a scalloped edge, like petals of a flower. Color variation within a mole. A good mole is the same color throughout. A potentially bad mole has different colors in it, including red, white, and blue. Diameter greater than six millimeters, about a pencil eraser in size. It's not to say that melanomas can't be tiny, they're smaller than that, but that's kind of a benchmark that, that we've followed over the years. The E is elevation or evolution. So a mole is changing. That is something that should be brought to your physician's attention and, and a biopsy done. So this is, again, showing the color variegation here. This white is called regression. That means this patient's body sees something bad there, and it's trying to eat it up. So this just is a good comparative chart, benign and malignant. Again, even edge is good. Even border, you know, this is symmetric on both sides, even border, even color, diameter is pretty small, and then evolving. We take pictures of our patients to follow moles that are changing. So an evolving mole is changing in size and shape. So unusual presentations of melanoma, no kidding around. Kids can get melanoma, albeit rarely. 2% uh, of all melanomas occur under age 20. The SEER database that Dr. Tarhini mentioned reported about a 3% increase in melanomas in adolescents and young adults. And why do you think that's happening? Tanning beds. A hair raising experience that means scalp melanoma. We are educating hairdressers on how to look at the scalp. And they are picking up squamous cell cancers, basal cell cancers, and melanomas and sending them to dermatologists now because, again, you can't see the top of your head. So again, the more we can educate folks, the better. And then nail the diagnosis, nail bed melanoma. That's why we look at the nail beds, because you can get melanomas under your nail. 50% of childhood melanomas can be traced to pre-existing lesions. About 30% of them arise in the giant congenital um, moles I, I mentioned, and I'll have a picture in just a minute to show you. And more than half of these change before puberty. So we're following these kids very closely to look for any changes in their birthmarks. Children, interestingly, have a relative um, a tendency to have more amelanotic. That means they don't have brown moles. They look flesh-colored. And it's rare that kids get new moles. So if we see a child come in with a, a, a mole that's kind of pinky, light brown, we will do a biopsy. And they tend to be deeper at diagnosis overall. So these are birthmarks. This is a birthmark on the scalp of this Asian child. And sometimes they have increased hair growth. Increased hair growth in a mole means nothing. So there's a lot of old wives' tales that say hair growth is good or bad. It means nothing as far as how that mole is going to behave. It's the size that we pay attention to. So most birthmarks are under 1.5 centimeters. They're small and have a really low risk of turning into a melanoma. Large congenital nevi are over 9 centimeters, so size of your palm. And then giant congenital um, moles are over 20 centimeters, so the much larger, like this one. So this is a baby laying on his belly. This is called a bathing trunk nevus, because so it looks like a bathing suit. And this is a very high-risk mole, high-risk birthmark, because we're going to follow that child very, very closely. So about 300 patients a year under age 20 develop melanoma. The risk of develop, developing melanoma in one of those giant congenital nevus is about 12% overall, looking at the literature. 
So these are patients we'll send to Dr. Gassman. And if there's a possibility of, of removing some of that tissue and having a good cosmetic and functional outcome, we will do that because of that high risk. In kids in particular, when moles go bad, you'll notice a sudden increase in size and bleeding, more so than in adults. So that's just something that we've noted over the years, and of course, color change. So this is a scalp melanoma. Uh, as you would imagine, when patients get thinning hair, people don't put sunscreen on their head. It's icky, it's gooey. Um, they are making shampoos now with some sunscreens in them, but the bottom line is it's very easy to get a lot of sun damage on the top of your head and cause something like this. That's why we're educating the hairdressers. And then this is a nail bed melanoma. In general, patients who come in with a brown streak in their nail, and it can also be red, it's over about three millimeters in diameter, we will do a biopsy because it's at a higher risk of being melanoma. In general, the pigment here starts right at what's called the proximal nail fold or the cuticle, and then it just marches and grows the whole length of the nail. So how do we diagnose these? We use our eyes, the clinical exam. Dermatoscopy means we're using a tool, as is shown here, that gives us magnification with polarized light, and it specifically shows us the pigment patterns, and there's good pigment patterns and bad pigment patterns, so it will frequently talk us into biopsying a mole that, with our naked eye, didn't look so bad. Total body photography we use on our patients who have hundreds of moles, basically just to monitor for change, so we really bring up the pictures from visit to visit and look at them very closely to see if any of the moles have changed in size or color. And then if we're suspicious, we will do a biopsy. Computer-aided image analysis means the usage of machines such as what's called a Melafine, which we have here at the clinic, and I'll show you a picture of this in just a minute. But we use this machine to take pictures of moles that look funny on dermatoscopy. And it uses 12 different wavelengths of light to take a picture of that mole, and it compares it to 10,000 stored images of moles in the, in the computer, 600 of which are melanoma. And it will tell you, is it low risk to be a melanoma or high risk? And it just helps us decide what to biopsy. This is the total body photography that we do and an example of one of our patients. So it's very standardized photos that allows, allow us to track the moles. This is dermatoscopy showing bad things under that magnification. These are regular globules, this kind of bluish white veil. This is a melanoma, without a doubt. These are very characteristic findings. Again, just fine features that we're looking for that we can't see with the naked eye that tell us that we need to biopsy something like this, which was also a melanoma. This is the Melafine machine. This is Dr. Balin, who runs our Melafine clinic. And this is a stage patient, He's one of our nurses. They're taking pictures of the moles. They're stored in the computer. If the patient moves out of town, we give them a disc with all of their moles on it so they can take it to their next town so somebody can continue to follow them. This is, again, just showing the pictures that it's taking of a mole here. It, it maps where the picture was taken on the body and then what it looks like. And we can also take these with a phone. Fun. There's a lot of phone apps out there that can do this. So this is the mole under dermoscopy. You can see these, the, the pigment pattern much more clearly. It's kind of blotchy and globular, as we call it. And this is with the naked eye. So looking at this, you can't really say that's a good or a bad mole. But when you look at it with that handheld device, you can get an idea whether you should biopsy it or not. So what are our follow-up guidelines? The patient has some mild or moderately atypical moles, and that's something that the pathologist will grade when you do a biopsy. We see them once a year. If they have severely atypical nevi, which are on the spectrum toward going toward melanoma, and over 10 moles on their back, we see them about every six months. Melanoma in situ, again, limited to the upper layer of the skin. We generally see those patients once a year. And then the earlier stage melanomas, we see about every six to 12, six to 12 months for five years, and if nothing comes up in that time, we look at them once a year for life. And then the deeper melanomas, again, we're going to see those patients every three to six months. So we stratify your risk based on the depth and, and worry of that melanoma. Sun safety tips. I would like you all to take samples that I brought of sunscreen, please. Um, I brought higher numbers. We used to say SPF 15 was adequate for most folks, but what I will tell you is most people don't put enough on. In order to adequately cover your body to get a stated level of SPF coverage or sun protection factor coverage, you need to use a shot glass. Nobody uses a shot glass because it's gooey and messy and sticky. So and in addition, these are not made in what's called a linear fashion. So, for example, if you put half the recommended amount of a 30 on, you don't get a 15. You get an 8 or a 4. So what I do is I shoot high on the number, use a 45 or a 50, so maybe you'll use enough to get a 15, okay? 
you want to put it on at least 30 minutes before you go out so it can soak into the skin. Um, we do know that regular use of SPF 15 or higher reduces the risk of developing melanoma by 50%, so sun protection is so important. You're reapplying it every two hours when you're outdoors, even on cloudy days. There are protective, tightly woven clothing that have SPF built into them because of the weave that you can purchase. Um, an alternative to that that's less expensive is this RIT SunGuard product, and this is in the RIT dye section in the store. And you toss this powder in water, soak your most frequently worn summer garments in it. It puts an SPF of 30 on that shirt or dress or hat for 30, 30 for 20 washings. You can't smell it. You can't feel it. It's really a great way to get some extra sun protection for the summer. Wide brim hats are important. Sunglasses stay in the shade when possible. Avoid reflective surfaces, which can reflect up to 85% of the sun's rays, so sand, snow, water, and concrete. I'm in trouble on the golf course because I'm usually in the sand or near the water, so extra sun is coming up and, and hitting you there. Um, protect children. We generally start using sunscreens at age six months and older. Um, avoid tanning beds. Consider a self-tanner. I will tell you the self-tanners have gotten a lot better over the years. When I was a kid, all we had was QT. You all remember that? You look like a sweet potato. It was not natural. So there are a lot better ones now um, that you can put on that don't look fake. We call them fake bake, but there are some really good ones if you want to get that Saint Tropez look. And then just keep in mind the sun's rays are strongest between 10 and 4. This was mentioned earlier, and this is my last slide. We are really trying to restrict tanning bed use in the United States. In Ohio, for example, the yellow color here, you're required to have a parent or a guardian give permission for kids 18 and under, but there are some states that kids under 18 are not allowed in the tanning beds. And that's what we are trying to really promote is not getting that extra sun, which is causing the melanomas in the 25 to 39 age group. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.